So uh, our presentation today is going to be about optical survey astronomy at NCSA, specifically looking at two projects, the Dark Energy Survey, which is currently in operations, and for which NCSA participates in the data management portion of that, as well as the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope that is undergoing construction right now and will be deployed in operations around 2022, and NCSA will have a role in operating. So for the outline of the talk, First, we'll talk a little bit about the scientific motivation for the projects that NCSA is participating in in survey astronomy, and talk a little bit about what survey astronomy is and the statistical science uh, that, uh, that goes along with it, and then uh, elements of what it takes to actually build a sky survey, including the instrumentation, and data acquisition, uh, the processing of the data, and eventually the, the serving and access uh, for the data for the community. And then we'll talk more broadly about what it means to be part of an organized collaboration and what it takes to manage uh, large-scale science projects. Uh, so to begin, just briefly, uh, NCSA and the University of Illinois have a long history in astronomy, both on the instrumentation uh, aspects of it, as well as on the, uh, the simulation side. So within large collaborations, we've, part we've participated in radio astronomy in the BIMA and KARMA. Uh, collaborations, which uh, ended in observing in 2015. And then, as I said, we participate in DES, which uh, began operations in 2013 and will continue uh, observing until 2019. And then LCST, which begins observing in 2022 and extends for 10 years. And we also have a large uh, simulation component at NCSA um, that's gone on since the beginning and since its founding. Uh, because the founding motivation of NCSA was actually that supercomputers could perform uh, the meaningful astrophysics computations that were needed for example, for black hole uh, simulations. <clears throat> uh, so the science motivation behind these projects uh, really has to do with dark energy. Uh, dark energy was discovered in the late 1990s with um, the publications that were made uh, by uh, Paul Perlmuter, um, Brian Schmidt, and uh, Adam Reese. Uh, which studied um, around 50 to 100 supernovae and found that the acceleration or the expansion of the universe was actually accelerating. And so dark energy was the, the term that's, that's been coined to name the physics that will explain why the universe is expanding at this accelerating rate uh, rather than slowing down that we'd expect from the mutual gravitation, uh, gravitational force between all of the, the physical matter in the universe. Uh, in, the, in the US, uh, the Dark Energy Task Force uh, produced a report in 2006 that identified a four-stage observational program to study the nature of dark energy and to determine the fundamental properties of it. NCSA actually participates in both stage three and stage four observational programs. These programs are jo jointly funded uh, by the, uh, the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy and have uh, significant budgets on the order of 100 million to a billion dollars. So the Dark Energy Survey is a stage three observational program. Its uh, scientific mission is that it's designed to probe the origin of the accelerating universe and to help uncover the nature of dark energy by measuring the 14 bil billion year history of cosmic expansion with high precision. The, the goal is not to determine exactly what dark energy is, but to highly constrain it through a series of probes um, that, that the Dark Energy Survey is specifically designed uh, to use. The Large Synoptic Survey Telescope is a follow-on, so it's a stage four program that's designed to probe the nature of dark energy to higher uh, constraint. And it all is also actually a general, uh, general purpose observatory. So it will also be probing the nature of dark matter, as well as looking more locally, cataloging our solar system, exploring the transient sky, looking for th the variable universe, things that move and things that change in brightness, and mapping the structure and the formation of the Milky Way. So DES and LSST are part of a generation of surveys. As I said, it's a, DES is a stage three and LSST is a stage four dark energy task force uh, observing program. Um, I already mentioned uh, DES began operations in 2013 and uh, will extend until 2019 about the time that LSST begins its observing program. So LSST will be building on the observing that, uh, that the dark energy survey has done and the science exploitation that has come out of it. DES observes for a fraction of the year, each year, uh, because of uh, the nature of the science program. It's looking specifically at the um, outside of the plane of the Milky Way. So it observes a fraction of the time during the year that, 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 that the Milky Way is not overhead. LSST, because of its general purpose, 
science will be observing almost every night of the year for a total of 10 years. DES maps uh, about 12%, about an eighth of the night sky. LSST will be looking at covering the entire southern sky, so 50% of, of the uh, entire sky. The total data volume that's generated at the end of the dark energy survey is about five petabytes. And for LSST, because of the amount of data that is being taken and the size of the instrument, we'll increase it to 500 petabytes. Uh, and the number of observed galaxies uh, extends from 300 billion in DES to what is expected to be 20 billion in LSST. And the number of observed supernovae, as I said, the initial paper that discovered dark energy uh, had about on order of 50 to 100 supernovae. DES is expected to find 3,000 supernovae, and LSST will hope to, hopes to find 500,000 supernovae. So hope, hopefully better constraining the nature of dark energy through these measurements. So these, both DES and LSST, are uh, sky surveys, and they differ from traditional astronomy in several ways. Traditional astronomy, observational astronomy is very much target driven. So uh, PIs will propose to get time on telescopes to look at specific objects of interest. They have their um, observing program understood at that point uh, when they make these proposals. And so the data sets that are built up are um, kind of patchy, not, not statistically understood as a whole, and the image processing and calibrations of, the, of those data are very custom to the observing programs that the PIs are, are seeking. Um, so the areas of the sky are also not regularly revisited. This is very different from um, the modern survey astronomy, which is much more data-driven and optimized for statistical studies. So the goal is to build up large, high-quality, and uniform data sets uh, for statistical analysis of objects and to have very well-characterized uh, systematics. We revisit this, the areas of the sky uh, regularly to build up a catalog of the same objects and see how they evolve over time. Um, and we produce large sky maps uh, to uniform depth and coverage. The uh, consequence of having a survey is that you can serve many research areas and interests simultaneously and also to allow for discovery of new objects and phenomena. So it's not necessarily driven by the science that is expected to be gotten, but actually new science could, could, be, um, could be found from these large data sets. So what does it take to actually put together a sky survey? Well, we're going to need a very large and dedicated telescope so that we can collect lots of light and that we can collect it, on, uh, we can have an observing program that is uh, specialized for the survey. So if it's a dedicated instrument, it's a dedicated telescope, then we have the time that we need um, to, to get the uniform coverage in depth. We need a camera that has a wide field of view so we can see a lot of the sky at once. And as I said, we need a, uh, an observing plan that, we, um, that will cover the sky uniformly and in an efficient way. And finally, what we'll need is, an, is a system that will capture, process, serve, retain, and manage all the data uh, and make it useful for science exploitation. So that's what the schematic is on the bottom of the uh, slide there. Uh, we, we start out with observations. We have different cadences in which we process the data. Uh, for the uh, annual processing, as you see there, we actually do this many times over and over again as the, uh, the data are better characterized, as the calibrations are improved. Uh, and then we provide access to the data, serve it out to the collaborations and to the community. Uh, scientific analysis can be done on it and eventually science. And underneath all of this is a very large uh, uniform production program for data retention and management. So a little bit of, uh, about the instrumentation that is used. DES uses an existing telescope that's uh, in Chile at the Cerro Toro Inter-American Observatory. It is the Blanco 4-meter telescope. And DES, the uh, project, built a brand new camera to accomplish this, the scientific mission. It's a 570 megapixel camera with six, 62 CCDs, and it has uh, five different filters, so it can essentially see in five different colors. And it covers 20 times the area of the full moon with one exposure, so it's a very wide, uh, wide camera that can help to, uh, that is exactly what you need to, to do a, a survey, uh, to, to conduct a survey. And the picture on the bottom left there is actually uh, Josh Freeman, the director of, of, the, of DES, or former director of DES, I should say, sitting next to the Blanco telescope. Still current. Still current. Oh, I said. I'm a short fuse. Okay. Uh, 
Um, so DES is a five-year survey covering about 5,000 square degrees of the southern sky or about an eighth of the sky. The sky coverage is optimized for cosmology. It is overlapping complementary surveys like the South Pole Telescope uh, survey so that for calibration uh, mostly um, and to build off of prior uh, data sets. And it specifically avoids the galactic plane uh, because the interest is not in any of the local objects uh, and also to avoid any of the, the dust and obscuration that you get from the Milky Way. Uh, each section of the footprint that you'll see on the, uh, the bottom left of the screen there shows the footprint actually of the sky coverage of DES. Each section of that footprint is observed multiple times in each filter to build up a uniform data set. Certain fields within that footprint are actually revisited every 10 nights um, to conduct a supernova search. So an image is taken 10 nights later, we go back to the same place and build up a data set over five years to see, to find, um, to find supernovae, specifically type 1a supernovae, which is exactly what's in the picture on the bottom right there. And hopefully this plays. This is a nice little visualization that actually shows um, over, I want to say the first three years of DES operations, the actual chronological um, mapping out of the sky. So you'll see the, the DES footprint there and how we're starting to fill in um, the, the total sky coverage. And here we'll get to zoom in and see uh, some of the uh, beautiful objects that have already been discovered by, uh, or at least observed by, by DES. And the depth that you're seeing is really, uh, really the inferred depth by analyzing the objects in multiple colors. This was put together by the Advanced Visualization Lab at NCSA. Uh, so LSST, the next generation uh, uh, instrument, is building a brand new observatory, just one peak over in, Las, in, in Chile on Cerro Pachon. Um, that's a, a kind of a schematic of what it will look like uh, when it's, when it's finished. It's currently undergoing construction. Uh, it's also built uh, a new uh, eight meter telescope. So we're getting a bigger sky coverage and a new 3.2 gigapixel camera with 189 CCDs that will observe in six different filters. And LSST will see about 40 times the area of the full moon. So again, we're getting that very wide field uh, view that is uh, central for sky surveys. LSST is a dedicated 10-year survey, so it will be observing every single night. It is used, the, the telescope and instrument are used specifically for the LSST mission, and it will cover over 18,000 square degrees, which is roughly the entire southern sky. This will include the galactic plane because of the scientific um, mission of LSST is also to look at the Milky Way and the solar system, so we will work within the galactic plane as well. Each section of the footprint is observed roughly every three nights. And so essentially what we will do is be building up a movie of the sky. So we uniquely are exploring a time domain aspect uh, of astronomy within, within LSST. So once the data uh, have been, um, let's see. Yes. Uh, so, yes, get, once the data have been acquired, we go through a series of processing because the raw data that is generated off of these instruments is not anywhere near science ready. On the right hand side, you actually see a, a cutout of a, a DES uh, image from the, from the dark energy camera, um, and those are the CCDs there. It's, it's very much uh, not science ready. You can see the difference in the amplifiers, you can see streaks from saturated stars. Um, and you can see that there's gaps between all the CCDs. So there's a lot of sources of noise um, that, that come from the electronics, from non-uniform pixels, from the sky itself. 
for, from uh, oversaturated pixels, from high energy particles and cosmic rays that create streaks on, on the images, from uh, satellites that are passing overhead at the time that create streaks throughout the image. So a lot of objects that we don't want. So there's a, a large amount of uniform data processing that has to occur to, to, um, to calibrate the images and make them science ready. Once we've calibrated the images, we characterize the objects um, that we do want uh, in, in those images in terms of their size, their shape, their brightness, and their color, and build up a large catalog of all the objects that are observed. And we will often correlate these objects with prior observations that were made of those objects. So DES, the, the pipeline, uh, the raw images are actually, uh, start obviously in Chile. They uh, end up in the US via Tucson, and they are stored at NCSA. They arrive within minutes of, of being taken. And we collect about 18,000 images per night or about a terabyte a night. And we do processing on a nightly basis that inflates to about five terabytes a night. So over five years, it builds up quite a bit of data. The data are processed in two cadences, um, promptly within 24 hours. This is for, uh, for detecting, specifically detecting supernovae so that follow-up can be done on spectroscopic instruments. We also provide quality feedback to the observing uh, program to say whether or not the images that were taken were of survey quality or whether they need to be uh, re-observed. Uh, re and we also then, uh, every year, take all of the data that has been taken thus far and we reprocess it all with the latest calibrations, the latest science algorithms, and we do this all uniformly um, to, to get the deepest and best catalogs. On the, uh, Right hand side there you see a little schematic of what the different pipelines are that DES runs um, once it acquires the data. Okay. Uh, LSST data processing is fairly similar. The acquisition actually happens a little bit faster though. It's in near real time. Raw images travel from Chile to NCSA within seconds of being taken and we collect about 15 terabytes a night. Over 10 years this is again going to build up petabytes of data. We process the data again on two cadences promptly, where now we're talking within 60 seconds. This is because LSST is exploring the time domain of astronomy and looking for things that change on, um, on a 60 second cadence. So we're we'll generating alerts for um, objects that have moved, objects that have changed in brightness, um, new objects that were detected, and we also provide feedback to the observing program. And again, we also annually reprocess all of the data uniformly. Uh, for best calibrations and, and the deepest catalogs. And I will turn it over to Don. So now I'm going to talk a bit about data releases to the science community. And the first slide actually shows that there are four major aspects when we plan. There's the data products themselves. There's the documentation that makes the data scientifically useful. There are interfaces that where one gets to access the data or come and interact with the data. And then for all data, there's a need for scientific support. Um, in detail, I've got uh, detailed lists of what's, uh, what's involved in each step in the text boxes that are next to that, and I'll just highlight uh, a few things. The data products, for example, we know that they have to be available, but they also need to be backed up, for example, because the data are valuable. It takes many years to acquire them. Of course, they sit on hardware. The documentation is very important, and DES, the standard for documentation is that the doc data should be documented to the standard of a peer-reviewed paper, for example, that has to be pulled together. The, the, in order to make the peer-reviewed paper, of course, we would have to use the data scientifically to, to show that we, the collaboration had used it before, for example, releasing it to the public. The interfaces are also very important. They're both kind of visual interfaces that one uses to explore the data and programmatic interfaces that one uses to obtain it. And lastly, uh, support, of course, means that you have to keep everything running, that you, in the short term, in the long term, you have to collect information from your users to understand how effective your system is. You have to uh, provide uh, uh, um, privacy, for example, for, for proprietary data sets in the dark energy survey the data are proprietary to the collaboration for two years. I'm sorry, the data are proprietary until a data release is made. Two public data releases of all the data are, 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 are planned, plus in sort of informal releases for data supporting the collaboration's papers. In LSST, the data are proprietary for two years before becoming public. Next. 
So the key what are the key functions in data access? And in the modern world, this is not just giving you a place to take files. Right? The goal is to provide a variety of tools and a variety of deployment scenarios to provide both for download, which is what everybody expects, but for large data, meaningful computation next to the data. Uh, to do meaningful computations on the data does, doesn't always mean that the data of any one survey is sufficient. So you need to support uploading data from other instruments. For example, Margaret mentioned in the context of DES, part of the rationale for the footprint is overloading with um, infrared surveys, for example, where the DES cannot observe. And to extract science, one might want to combine infrared catalogs with uh, the bands that the visual bands that does observes. We have uh, once you start doing that, you have to support groups doing computations next to the data, since much science is collaborative and done it with groups of varying scale. And of course, you have to provide an interactive and visualization environment that, ex that to support exploring the data, to understand what people are while well, people understand the computations they're performing, uh, and so on. The kind of toolkit that's available and, and, and the common vocabulary is uh, shown in the What is Data Access panel, which includes things which includes things like workflow engines, various kinds of storage systems, Jupyter Jupyter notebooks, which uh, people seem to enjoy right now, um, and uh, uh, you know various sorts of normal toolkits, including security uh, to the extent that the data are secure, but also authentication and authorization so, so that groups can work in private unobserved by other groups using the same facility. And the thinking is, of course, for large data sets, uh, this all best occurs right next to the data without requiring large downloads. Uh, the other aspect of this is once one becomes centralized is that the system has to be usable and, and we'd like to have it highly usable. Uh, User-centric design is uh, the principle that we apply when we work on user interfaces here at NCSA. Uh, it is uh, important to uh, um, that as time goes along, the interface itself is well tailored to its use, which means studying and understanding how scientists actually act access the data, not just merely providing a bunch of controls that allow for access somehow. And so this is our principal strategy for optimizing access. And you can see that we have a kind of cyclic design pattern that is presented there, uh, and I will just uh, uh, leave it for, for you to see. So in DES, so, so there's DES data access. Uh, there are two, uh, what's, so let me review what's in the science, right? There are more than 500 nights of observing in this archive, there will be when we're done. 500 million catalog galaxies and 100 million stars, right? And there are many open problems that can be studied uh, studied uh, with this, it's, it's, it's you know, statistics, so understanding the systematics in there, new objects, new physics, and a variety of topics, uh, some of which are the core interest of the dark energy survey and some like solar system objects, which are not. All right, and the survey itself is almost completed, and there is a very large data release one covering the first three years of, uh, of observing available to the public. In the two columns below on this slide, uh, data access for DES is partitioned into two parts. One is uh, the, our self-release of, of data to the, to, within the collaboration. Kind of not shown here is that we'll, of course, allow anybody in the collaboration to take anything that we have, including some unsupported data sets that are suitable for early science. Uh, but our prime, uh, our prime structured interface to this is depicted in the picture on the left, which is easy access uh, web interface, which is a kind of astronomer friendly SQL that uh, lets one get into all of our databases. All of DS data catalogs are in a, a large Oracle relational database, I might as well mention. Uh, Jupyter Lab combined with Easy Access provides a computational environment where people can look at things in notebooks and download codes and run them. Um, a, key, a key kind of data service for astronomy is something called cutouts, where when somebody was in interested in objects typically of a certain kind of characteristics, Instead of downloading all the big images that would have contained the object, a cutout service provides uh, cutouts, cutout images around de designated objects. It's very important for enabling science. The footprint server tells you something about what was observed at what depth, with what systematics, under what conditions. And then lastly, I'll just mention there's the status page for our users to understand when our services are for down. 
Uh, easy Access Online is a, a way of submitting jobs that take a long time to compute their uh, outputs, and so the outputs are available uh, through batch, batch type means. Uh, for the public data release, I first want to back up a bit and say that in the Dark Energy Survey, we're collaborative. We have the National Optical Observatories as a, as a partner. We also have a Brazilian group that is interested in scientific data access. The total um, presentation for public data releases involves either software or facilities at each, at each center. The, we serve the data from NCSA with the philosophy of more or less making available the subset of tools that we feel are appropriate for the public that our own scientists use. The, 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 the NOAO, the National Optical Astronomical Observatories, also serve the data from their data labs installation in Tucson. So DES public releases are available from two places. Uh, what I'm show, uh, two places. At NCSA, it's available with the interface semantics that the Brazilian group presents, which I'm not presenting here due to lack of time and space. Uh, and I'm showing uh, what, the, what the NCSA portal to the data looks like. And the big takeaway is more or less, it's more or less a subset of what we let the collaboration do. Uh, DES economics and the, the design era of DES means that we mostly provide access to the data, somewhat in the spirit of a, um, a CAS server, but we don't use CAS server technology. So we're pro fundamentally providing access through catalog searches, downloading images, and cutouts. LSST, on the other hand, has fully implemented the vision of computing next to big data. This is the, uh, it, again, there's on the Right, there's a summary that what you know what is what is the penultimate LSST archive like? It's observations from every usable night for 10 years. It's got 18 billion objects in the first year, 40 billion by the end of the survey, 1,500 images per night. There's streaming and static data, streaming in the sense of alerts going out on a stream, static data being the record of the survey. And it's of course its target is to capture new physics, moving variable objects and participate fully in the multi-messenger astronomy era. Uh, the, the panel on the lower left uh, shows the features that are being implemented right now, is that there is a science portal that gives kind of a view at a web, lets you browse data at, at, uh, through codes that run in your browser on sort of a traditional display that's supplied, that, that is coded and supplied by uh, IPAC. There's a Jupyter Lab and Jupyter Hub instrument implementation. There are web APIs, RESTful service APIs to go pull data. And the data resources underneath that are enumerated in the panel below that include catalogs and files, the things you would expect. So what's interesting is actually the, both DES and LSST more or less, more or less had independent designs and independent thinking about their and if you go back and review those uh, slides I showed you, in fact, you'd find remarkable convergent evolution in the approach and remarkable convergent ev ev evolution in the capabilities, except that does, doesn't, doesn't, can't afford uh, computations next to the data for a community, not part of its mission. Um, we've been thinking about data access in the, in the context of astronomy since the way back, as starting with supporting astronomy and ast astrophysics. And as we worked on these various projects, one notices the tendency to rely on standard stacks with just astronomical customizations, uh, only where needed. And for example, uh, if one is study, if one's primarily dedicated to statistical studies, and one was interested in understanding statistical anomalies in the data, uh, a very kind of conventional technology stack emerges and is pictured on the panel uh, to the right, uh, a technology stack that we have here at NCSA, and we find many things are beginning to converge to. So now I want to kind of shift gears, and instead of talking about fun and data access and getting data like responsibility. <laughs> so as we mentioned before, the budget, the overall budgets for these projects are in the hundreds of millions, of, uh, darn near approaching a billion. Uh, 
all of a sudden this all of a sudden one incurs a lot of responsibilities that one doesn't have if one's doing a small observing program with all allocated time on telescope right and also the statistical nature of the processing and the statistical nature of the science demand a kind of regularity so you know here's the statement well managed production facilities are required for long lived and statistic based investigations on scale of dozen analysis um, what are the what are the needs that such a such a facility would begin to satisfy right is the quality of the science depends on control of production and understanding the systematics in the production system so the software itself has to be studied for its characteristics and it has to be run in a uniform way so that such studies are possible and so that one can understand what the software does and what it doesn't and what it does to the statistics. The systems, since they serve a very large community, have to have defined availability. And in many cases, uh, satisfying demanding service levels. In DES, for example, support of observing was kind of um, not as critical as LST. The, the availability requirements for supernova processing and the dark energy survey in the written documents are overnight uh, 80 percent of the time and always within three days when one looks at the 60 second turnaround time for LSST and the ambitious system that sends data across hemispheres in order to emit and cal calculate and emit the the transients at NCSA the uptime requirement is for a complex system and the uptime basically the uptime requirement is to be available when the observatory is available including real scientific observing but also calibration tests any such system that lasts 10 years has to be able to change, adapt to the needs of the experiment, which are discovered after, as the experiment proceeds. Uh, the system underneath it, the technical system, has to be maintainable, that you have to be able to evolve the underlying services and infrastructure that have practical lifetime for over 10 years, but and also have to last for 10 years and be in continuous service for 10 years. So an enterprise architecture approach is kind of warranted where you figure out how to move an existing running system from here to there, possibly in small steps, possibly not along a direct path in order to maintain production and service. These are big dollar experiments, and at least in the US, uh, fiducial responsibilities towards your stakeholders providing the money are an important precondition on obtaining the money. Uh, rigorously defined reporting requirements for funding agencies come with the budgets of this scale and projects of this duration. And then lastly, as due to the, you know, one can think of the value of the experiments as expressed almost totally in the data that's produced. And when one talking about managing data and you think about a billion dollar experiment, you have to think in some way that you're managing a billion dollars worth of data, which is not Bitcoin. Right? Can't lose it, can't mess up, must keep it, must provide for disaster recovery. So, what all those responsibilities induce a kind of a funny kind of big data problem of its own. It's not big data on the scale of exabytes, but it is actually a complex piece of data that has to be kept man managed well and is needed for all these management tasks. I mean, what do you have to do with this data, right? You have to define the production processes and understand what they are and what they do. For availability, you have to define an enclave system with appropriate availability characteristics. For example, if you take LSST, we may not take down the online production system for alerts because we want to maintain the offline databases. Right? So all the system has to be sorted out into various pieces that with the availability and usability characteristics understood. You have to understand the impact of every change, especially where the availability requirements are especially high. You have to evolve the system in an understood way. So you have to update hardware and software underneath the sheets. You have to have appropriate processes to test if you're trying to keep high availability. Uh, if you want to take good care of the data, you have to enumerate the data management policies, get a hold of them all. You can't have people del accidentally deleting Scratch when valuable data is on Scratch. I'm not saying that's ever occurred. And you have to report on usability, effectiveness, costing to various points of view because projects of that size have various stakeholders who want reports to custom to their point of view. They don't want to get a PhD in your system and figure out what it is they're looking for. If you look over to the two pieces of eye candy on the right-hand screen, I first want to draw your attention to that cyclic, that cyclic drawing down there. Uh, this is a bit of conventional IT management framework. Uh, it, gi it gives us a methodology to follow. Uh, the methodology we're following is derived principally from this thing called the TOGAF ADM. What does that mean? That's a bunch of 
uh, enterprise architecture standards defined by the open group. It stands for the open group architecture framework architecture development model. And if you look at that, part of it, the green stuff is the hardware you got. The blue labels is the application software you need to get your stuff done. The yellow is the business case that you're actually taking care of. And the rest of it is made of stuff. How does one, how does one deliver small incremental improvements and schedule their installation of the system? And the top is like, what are we, what are we doing and why are we doing it? Uh, a, a pra uh, in practice, we use an architecture tool, a tool uh, with implementing the Archimate methodology. A particular tool we use is called Archie. And there's an eye candy drawing showing, uh, showing uh, uh, this is our way of keeping all those interoperating pieces consistent. One attempts to do this in spreadsheets and one finds that one just can't do it. The drawings are a way of entering the data in a way that you can keep it mutually consistent. The point is, of course, not the drawings. The fact that the, all that data, that all those relation, semantic relationships between all those pieces are available to us as, as relational data. And we're exporting them to things like configuration management databases, which describe the live system, but also are, are working to export them to financial management uh, tools so that we can do financial type reporting and various other tasks. Okay, uh, good. Uh, so the last thing I want to point out is that what we do here at, at, here at NCSA is no means everything that it takes to get the science, get and extract the science. Uh, what is shown on the right is a dark energy survey org chart as of a certain date. Uh, we are totally responsible for only a few of those boxes. They're mostly in the right green, right, bright green, sorry. But as you can see, delivering any kind of effective science means that a li liaison is needed to a variety of organizations. Basically, that's eye candy, but blue is the internal management of the, of the survey itself concerning with data rights and all kinds of things. The aqua, or the, in the middle, is the science working groups that are working to exploit the data, deliver deliverables to the various stakeholders who fund it. And the bright green over on the right is the execution production part of the system. And the top is executives and the top orange are agency, some of the agencies we report to. Uh, I think uh, that's it, right? Let's go one more. Right, and so right on time, I think, we wanna thank you for letting us talk to you. Here are a bunch of URLs uh, for people that want to, to uh, not listen to questions, but go click on and see what we actually do. And thank you very much. <laughs>